Welcome. So I'm Jeff Saul, and we're going to be talking about uh, creative active learning activities for scale-up classrooms. But in addition to talking about the activities, I'm also going to talk about some of the basics um, about how you teach in, the, in a classroom like this. Um, I know when I first started uh, 20 years ago in this room, so scale-up started with Bob Beekner at NC State. He was the project PI. I was his first project postdoc. Um, I got there basically up until that point. Um, <laughs> up until that point, uh, no one had taught us, uh, had taught a studio class, an integrated lecture lab with minimal lecturing for more than, for more than 50 people. And more common was 30 to 40 people. And so I got to know NC State and Bob Beekner takes me aside and says, okay, here's what we want to do, make it work. And I've been working on that ever since. What's your background? My background, okay. So um, I have a, my PhD is in physics, uh, but my dissertation research was in physics education research. And uh, before I started working with Bob Beekner, I was at University of Maryland with Joe Reddish, who is my advisor. And I worked on the uh, MPEX, the Maryland Physics Expectation Survey, which is a survey of cognitive attitudes, students' beliefs about what physics is, how it is learned, and what they need to do to succeed in a physics class. Um, I also looked, worked with 10 colleges and universities, looking at their different approaches to active learning and evaluating their active learning programs in introductory physics courses compared to their traditional courses, either taught in parallel or taught previously. And I collected data from these schools for about four years. And then my dissertation was look, taking that evaluation work, um, looking at specifically conceptual understanding and these cognitive beliefs, and looking at what happened from the beginning, the beginning of Intro Physics 1 to the end of Intro Physics 2. Well, basically, end of each class in that two semester sequence. Um, and so that basically up until that point, when you were asking about whether a class was successful, uh, most people were just talking about exam scores and grades. And so we were talking about the, what we call the hidden curriculum, our expectations of students that often we don't necessarily express to the students about what we want them to do and what we want them to get out of a course. Then I worked with Bob Beekner and on my own on Scale Up uh, for about 10 years. I started my own scale-up program at University of Central Florida. Um, I was able to get about, mm, well, uh, well, I guess, but, uh, translating the money is probably, but I got substantial grants uh, from the National Science Foundation and from the U.S. Department of Education to start scale-up there and also to work with other schools that were interested in implementing scale-up or a version of scale-up at their own institutions. So I actually made site visits during that time to MIT, uh, Rochester Institute of Technology, MIT is Massachusetts Institute of Technology, um, let's see, and a few other schools I'm blanking on at the moment. And then I would run workshops, uh, typically weekend workshops on how to teach scale up um, at UCF where I brought in faculty both from UCF and from other universities that were starting it. Two of the more successful universities were uh, Florida State University and um, Clemson, who came to our workshops. Uh, then I went and worked at Florida Institute, sorry, Florida International University in Miami, uh, where I worked with smaller studio classes implementing the modeling curriculum or modeling instruction curriculum. This is a program that was developed at Arizona State University. It was developed for high school. We adapted it for use at the university. And there it was used as a tool to recruit more physics majors and also to enhance their, basically improve retention and improve what students were learning in the course. And it was very successful. And in fact, it was particularly successful at recruiting and retaining female physics majors, who then became, uh, at least a half dozen of which have since graduated with their PhDs. After that, I went, uh, taught as a lecturer at the uh, University of New Mexico. And I worked with introductory astronomy and physics. I ran the astronomy lab. Uh, taught a what's called a parachute class. It was a class for students who were failing the first half of the semester and wanted to, rather than just allow them to either drop or fail, uh, we gave them an option of taking this course 
that would help them work on building up the skills and knowledge they needed to be more successful in physics. Introductory physics tends to cover a very, if you look at the way it's designed, it covers a very large number of topics and it goes at such a pace that sometimes it's very hard to develop a good understanding of the basic ideas and if you don't get the basic ideas of things like velocity, acceleration, and force in the first few weeks, the rest of the course is very hard to understand and you end up having to memorize an awful lot to be able to pass. Uh, so this parachute class was hoping to prepare that. Um, unfortunately, I'm not sure how successful I was because although um, my parachute students were succeeding at a better rate than the students who did not take the parachute class when they retook Physics 1, uh, when we accounted for GPA, it turned out there was no difference. That was just one of the projects I worked with there. Oh, and I also ran uh, modeling teacher workshops. And I also worked in various teacher preparation programs over the last uh, 20 years. That's my background. <laughs> so you may guess I've been doing this for a while. Okay, so just, you might say, just to sort of help justify why we're doing this at the beginning, I wanted you to give some idea of what, what results we um, physics classes have been able to get from scale up over the last 20 years. And basically what we're seeing is enhanced problem solving skills developed, including the use of an expert pro problem solving protocol. Uh, conceptual learning has increased. We actually have measurable learning gains that we can show. Uh, the retention rates are much higher at NC states. Uh, for overall, uh, the retention rate, the failure rate, well, how do I put this? If you look at the ratio of students who failed in a regular class divided by the number of students who fail in a scale-up class, the regular class failure rate is two and a half times higher over six years. And for women and minority students, it's on the order of four to five times higher. And the other thing we found, and this actually really surprised us, um, was when we look at results, if we break the students into thirds at the beginning of the semester, and then compare their, what the, basically their achievements at the end of the semester, what we see is that the top third students actually benefit the most. And part of the reason we looked at this was because when I told my faculty that we were we basically, every school that's adopted scale-up that I've been working with um, has been able to reduce their DFW rate. They're basically failure to pass with a C rate or failure to have an acceptable pass by 40 to 60 percent. Every school. Um, but when I told my faculty that, their first reaction was, you're spending a lot of time on conceptual understanding. You're teaching them a lot of skills we don't bother with. This can't be good for our good students. And that's when we, that's when we started looking at that top third, because we already had that information. We just never actually evaluated it this way. And then we see that performance in later classes is actually enhanced. That was the other concern. I still get that concern. Just at a meeting last week, someone was asking me about that. Um, but basically, OK, they do this special program for a year, they cover maybe 80 to 90 percent of the material they cover in the regular classes. But how do they perform later on? Well, it turns out their performance in later classes is enhanced. Basically, that means they succeed at a, the failure rate for those students in the upper division classes is actually slightly lower. Well, statistically significant, but smaller. And we find that student attitudes are better. Um, so one of Bob Eatner's goals from the very first, and you can talk to Rebecca and I about that, we both heard this from him, one of his goals was to make a, um, to give the students a more positive experience in introductory physics. If you've talked to people who take an introductory physics, that's not often the first thing that comes to their mind. And what do we mean by a more positive experience? Well, we want them to come out happier, more satisfied with the course, but we also see attendance has increased. The worst attendance we've seen for a scale-up class, even one held at 7.30 in the morning, is 85% average attendance throughout the, throughout the term. 90% or better is more typical. So attendance is enhanced, whereas in lecture classes, a good average would be 70% for the same classes. We also, from observers looking at our classes, found that our students were asking more questions and better questions during class. And then we also got more positive responses 
when we did focus group interviews and surveys. So those are the reasons you might want to do a scale-up class. And that didn't quite come out right. Okay. Um, so I wanted to ask you first, you'll notice there's some index cards, small cards on your table. Um, here, if you could grab one, what I'd like you to do is write down two learning objectives or competencies you would like your students to learn next year that they were not able to learn in previous classes. If you're a new teacher or a student, imagine what, two imagine what your two top competencies or two big, what your two highest learning goals, most important learning goals would be if you were to teach a particular class or the class that you're teaching. So if you take a moment and do that, please. Um, what I'd like you to do is take the next two minutes and talk to your people at your table about your goals. Um, try and form groups of three or four. We should have that arranged. Okay, uh, I'm just going to ask a few of you to share um, your, learning, your learning goals. Valentina? I'm not a teacher, but if I were a teacher, <laughs> um, my main goals will be to first uh, for the, the students to learn to identify the main idea of the class or have a critical, develop a critical thinking. Um, and second, to break the barriers between students and teachers. So to, to get easy to communicate the, their doubt, questions. Okay, I'm sorry, what kind of barrier? Um, like when the teacher asks, uh, anybody has a question, and everybody's like, no one answers, but there are, but the students want to ask, but they are afraid. Okay. All right. Yes. Tengo básicamente dos dos objetivos. Uno es lograr que, los, lograr que los estudiantes reconozcan los elementos indispensables que hay en un ecosistema de emprendimiento. O sea, los estudiantes muchas veces no logran reconocer los diferentes actores que le pueden ayudar a su, a su iniciativa. Y siguiendo con esa, con esa necesidad o ese objetivo a lograr eh, requiero que los estudiantes identifiquen las conexiones que hay entre esos actores para ayudarte a desarrollar tu idea. Excellent. Uh, one thing I left off my background is um, I actually stopped working at University of Mexico two years ago. I took a year sabbatical and became a web developer. And um, as a freelance web developer, I started hanging out with um, small business incubator programs. And I can, say, I can speak from experience that having people, uh, entrepreneurs know what those resources available is can really make a huge difference between whether they succeed or fail. Santiago? Um. Yo planteé dos objetivos, uno relacionado con los estudiantes de mecánica de fluidos y pretendo que ellos tengan la confianza para aplicar las bases en las situaciones problemáticas en su industria o en las aplicaciones afuera. Y el otro objetivo que planteé para los de termodinámica 
es eh, aplicar con confianza un enfoque sistémico para el análisis de sistemas energéticos. Cool. I'm sorry, am I mispronouncing your name? Fabiola. No, Fabiola. Okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, I teach in uh, logistic cost. And uh, one of the objectives that I have is to understand to the students to understand the activities, the logistics activities, and the relevance or or the importance in the competitive advantage of the companies. And another one is a uh, uh, one of the objectives is to have to analyze the balance sheet and the PNL of the companies in a, a, a strategic way. Very important for, entre for entrepreneurs, but anyone in business, actually. Good goals. Okay, active learning environments in general. I think Rebecca may have talked about some of this this morning. Um, but basically the key idea is we know that learning by doing is more effective than learning by listening. And so active learning environments are environments that in some part of the class, this, that's what the students are doing. Now, whether you do this in a small part of the class in this room, a room like this, or a large part of the class time in a room like this, that's going to be up to your comfort level. Because whatever you do, you need to be comfortable. And one other thing to keep in mind is that just like any other type of teaching, teaching in a room like this requires learning to balance certain priorities. For example, you have certain things that you want to cover during the day, but if you're doing an activity and the students are learning what you want them to learn and they're doing a good job at it and they're getting benefit from it, sometimes it might be worth giving them more time, but you have to balance the value of what they're learning by their group activities versus your schedule, for example. So you seem to be having some interesting discussions, so I let that go on probably a little long, about a minute or two longer than I probably had, than I had planned, but it seemed beneficial. Now, the students, all active learning environments are based on the idea that students have to construct their own understanding. And so you want, uh, well, you want to have materials that are carefully designed to help them build that understanding. And that may, it may take some time to get the materials right. I mentioned that one of the schools that I worked with, making site visits, interviewing their students, interviewing their faculty, was Massachusetts Institute of Technology. They actually probably took the longest to get their curriculum right. It took them six years before they found the right types of activities, the right levels, the right amount of content um, that the students were happy with and the department was happy with. They also probably had the most, some of you mentioned, a few uh, faculty who were here in the workshops yesterday mentioned that sometimes students were a bit resistant. MIT probably had the worst problem of any school that I worked with in their resistance. Uh, part of the problem being that the course they were reforming uh, was a freshman class. And their, before this, they did scale up, uh, their freshman classes were pass fail and attendance was not required. In an activity-based environment, it's a very good idea to either have um, a re some type of positive reinforcement for the students, so you give them points for attendance or to require attendance, because if they're not here doing the activities, they're not going to be able to learn what you want them to learn. Um, Cooperative groups of three to four. You've noticed I mentioned forming groups of three or four earlier. With two people, one person tends to dominate the discussion. With three people, you actually have a more balanced discussion. With four people, you start moving away from that. And studies, at least in physics, have shown that when you have groups of four people, the fourth person tends to contribute about 10 to 15% of the time. So the way I like to do things is groups of threes are my preference. Groups of four I do by necessity because you can't always get a student population that's divisible by three. <coughs> and the other thing is, in a scale-up scale room or any active learning environment, is that the instructor's role has changed. Your role is no longer to be the authority and to tell students what, what is and what is not. Your role is to be more of a coach, basically helping them reach their goals. So, you wanna, so your goal is gonna be, first thing you wanna do when you assign an activity is probably walk around and listen to the various groups and see if they're discussing the types of things you want them to be discussing. 
Are they making progress of the activity? Are they stuck? And just to walk around without interacting with any of the groups, um, just to get an overview of how things are going. Then as you start going around and listening, see which groups are going faster um, and which groups are going slower. Faster groups, you want to ask them questions to make sure they understand what they've done so far, that they're not just speeding through the activity for the sake of completing the activity, but they're actually learning what you want them to learn from the activity. And uh, for the slower groups, you want to provide more help, but keep in mind in both cases, for the slower groups who are having difficulty um, completing the activity, your goal is to ask leading questions, Socratic questions, to help the students find their own answers. Now, as I said, it's balance. And so with slower groups, you might end up, you might end up telling them a few more things to help speed them along. But again, your job basically is to help them find the answers. OK, you really have to think of this as a different learning environment. This is a, what we call a studio classroom and, or a learning studio. And typically, when you use the word studio, if you went to an art studio, you would not expect to go there and listen to someone talk, tell you about art. You would expect to either go to an art studio to create art. And so a st studio environment ideally is one where, as I said, the students are, the basic, are learning by doing. And also sharing with their classmates. So the idea is you want to form a, the most important thing to do is to create a, a learning environment. And by this, I mean a space where students feel safe, even when they're not sure they're right, where they're not sure they're doing things correctly. Um, They've, they've completed the activity, but they're just not sure. You want them to feel free to share, to ask questions, uh, to talk to each other, to help each other. So you really want to think of this as a community of learners, people working together to learn as much as they can collectively as a group. OK, scale up. Now, one of the interesting things to me is that this acronym seems to change every few years. It was, I won't tell you what originally was, but this is what it is today. Student-centered active learning environment with upside-down pedagogies. Um, Student-centered, so carefully constructed collaborative teams sharing their work with the entire class. Active learning, well, that's what we've been learning about for the last day or so. Uh, the environment, as I said, this whole thing, this whole room here is a classroom environment. Round tables with three teams of three students, ideally. Uh, whiteboards around the room, technology support. Now, just out of curiosity, how many of you have heard of upside down pedagogies or an upside down classroom? Okay, a couple. Tell me what top down means. Top down is, I believe, the traditional method of teaching in which you give the concepts and then bring it down to students to start practicing. And down up is where the students analyze and start building up to come up to with the concept at the end. Is that correct? So in that case, <laughs> top down may be more what we think of as um, traditional instruction. Uh, yes, I believe so. OK, so that would be considered a right side up pedagogy. Oh, OK. <laughs> so an upside down pedagogy. So, up, right, so the opposite of upside down pedagogy is what we consider traditional lecture, which is where basically students come to class. And I think Rebecca commented on this yesterday. Very often you can go to class or you can read the book. Often you don't need, necessarily need to do both, because often what's being help, talked about in lecture is the same as what's being talked about in the book. Um, in upside down, and basically students go home and work, on what they're, and work on activities on what they're learning. And they use the home time, out of class time, as their processing time. That's the way I like to think of it. I like to think of lectures being very good at transmitting information, a lot of information in a very short time. But it doesn't give students a lot of opportunities to process that information internally and really make it their own. So, but that's what we do with that. In a traditional environment, that's what students do at home, is they're doing their homework, their projects, um, or whatever else you may assign them to do, and they're doing the processing at home. And it works for about 20% of our students, at least in the United States, that's what we found. And for the remaining 80%, we find they don't have the skills and motivation 
to do that process, as much of that processing as home as we would like, so we need to do something else. In an upside down pedagogy, um, information delivery happens more outside of class. So when we started this 20 years ago, that literally meant we would assign readings in the textbook and we would assign a, um, a warm-up, a homework assignment before class on that reading that they would have to do before. Uh, now it's a combination of readings, videos, watching simulations, uh, some relatively easy activities for students to do at home, and then giving them some guided questions uh, where basically they, they make basically, not, so they're not just free exploration, but they're actually we've giving them very targeted ideas that we want them to look at before they come to class. Yes? ¿Qué relación, ¿Qué relación tiene el concepto de upside down pedagogies con clase invertida, con flipped classroom? Okay. So the question is, what does upside down pedagogies have to do with flipped classrooms? And it's basically two names for the same thing. A flipped classroom is one where the students get information delivery outside of class, and in class they do activities to process the information in small groups with guidance from the instructors. Flipped classroom is basically the same idea. Oh, sorry, that is a flipped classroom. Upside down pedagogy is basically the same thing. Uh, just two words. We, neither of the, these terms existed 20 years ago. But that's effectively what, what we, we didn't realize. We, we heard the terminology. We realized that's what we've been doing for years in scale up, is we're asking the students to get, uh, to read up ahead of time, sometimes to do a short activity, an easy, uh, an easy activity to do at home, and come to class prepared, and we go and, fall, and, we go and take that further in class. Now, one of the things that surprised us was actually how effective that was. So I was working with, an, I was mentoring another instructor in teaching scale up for the first time, and uh, for actually for the second time. And between his first and second time, the textbook changed. It went to a new edition. Um, now, if you're going to do, if you're going to use textbook readings, I strongly recommend that you use a textbook worth reading. Not all textbooks are equally accessible to the students, and we picked one that was actually known for being very readable. Uh, the students had even commented on it, how much easier it was to read than the a book they had used in previous classes. Um, and what we found was we gave them an activity, in between the versions of the book, um, one type of diagram, actually in two, there were two examples where the diagrams had changed. For those of you, I know there's a couple STEM people in here, we went from drawing vector arrows to drawing field lines to, as a representation of field. And the book had made that change. The original book had done, basically found that they thought they, the author had said that the students found field lines too confusing, but he, got, he was persuaded by the publisher to include field lines in the next edition. And we noticed that without our teaching our students how to draw the field lines, they were drawing field lines the day, the, the day after the reading when they came to class. No one had taught them that. If, you've, if you know anything about field lines, you know this is not something students pick up on their own. So we, had, we had, so we knew they were doing the warm-up assignments, but what we didn't know was how much they were picking up until they actually showed us when two-thirds of the groups spontaneously were using a representation that they could not have picked up anywhere other than from the textbook. And nowadays, with videos and simulations, we can keep a much better job. Uh, one word of caution if you're using video is try to keep your videos to about five to 10 minutes. Any longer than 10 minutes, generally does not work very well as a pre-course video. You can have multiple videos, but each one should have that length. I don't know why that works. Two 10-minute videos work better than a 20-minute video, but it does. OK. Can I ask something? Sure. Do you have any example or idea? So we did a flipped. Uh, methodology, so you send them to watch a video, to read some papers, and then what kind of activity you can do during the classroom to evaluate these, uh, you know, techniques or the material they process at home. Okay. You, you do that through the course of your activities. Because if they've picked up what you want them to pick up from the pre-course activities, then when they do an in-class activity, they will either demonstrate some understanding of what they did at home, or they will not. So um, 
How many of you were here earlier for one of the previous workshops where we used the whiteboards? A few of you, okay. So we'll do this a little bit later, but uh, the whiteboards actually do two things. They perform a very good focus for, the, for each group. So basically the students focus their work and the summary of their results on the whiteboards while they're working on an activity. And the cool thing, I usually tell my students they have to do the whiteboard before they catch their notes up. Um, it makes it really easy when you walk around the room to see what the students are doing and where they are. But as you're walking around the room, listening to their discussions, and looking at what they're doing on their whiteboard, it should be very clear whether or not they've gotten what you want them to get out of that activity, uh, the pre-course activity. But again, if you're going to do the pre-course activity, there has to be some type of assignment, something they have to do that's going to be turned in that comes with it, because students need that incentive to spend the time to do that. Uh, writing a summary is typically not a good, not a good activity. Well, it depends. I would say, I would, I would suggest, for my students, that generally has not worked well, but my subject was maybe a little different than yours. Um, so what I would suggest is try that and see if it works. And if it works, great. And if not, maybe try asking them to write a sentence or two on very targeted questions. My experience suggests that the latter would probably be more helpful. If you give them something open like a summary, they don't always know what you want them to pay attention to. They, they don't know what, what's more important and less important in the, in the activity. Whereas if you ask targeted questions, they then have a better idea about what they should expect to have prepared for class. Define the three most important ideas. Exactly. Um, sometimes I can do some very general ones. So sometimes I'll just ask a very basic question uh, to test their conceptual understanding. Sometimes I'll say, what was the most interesting or surprising thing that you read? And then I'll ask, what is their mo more, most pressing question? That's, uh, that's an approach that you would use in the just-in-time teaching method, which can be, adapted to the can be adapted to any learning environment, really. As long as the instructor is willing, you have to provide a means of feedback for the students to, tell, to give you their responses. And you have to be willing to make alterations in what you're teaching based on what you're learning from the student feedback. Okay, so if you're, so some of you are not familiar with the terminology, but so you may not be as familiar with the approach. But our basic idea when we started this was that it would be like a class like literature. We actually said a, a class like, like a class on Shakespeare. Um, and, that, and you wouldn't go take a class on literature or specifically Shakespeare and expect the professor to read the book to you. That would sort of be a waste of the, of the professor's experience and probably not that useful for really exploring the meaning, the understanding, the symbolism, the themes of what you're doing. You would expect the students to read the book before they came to class. And as I said, you want to ask guiding questions to help students focus on key ideas. Um, you want them to try and express what they're, what they're learning from these pre-course activities in their own words. And then in class, you want to build understanding of what they did as pre-work through the activities. So the, the, the activities you do in class should be directly related to the pre-work. If your pre-work and your activities are not seen as being connected, your students are going to be very unhappy. And then as after class, the homework, the after class homework that they do, students should practice what they learn in class, deepen understanding, and maybe extend a little beyond what they did in class. Okay. So as you can tell, one of the advantages you have in this room, as opposed to some of the other rooms that your colleagues might be using, is students come in here and say, OK, something's going to be different. They don't often come into a lecture hall and feel the same way. So you have an opportunity from the very first moment they walk in, it's going to be different. This room really is designed to encourage group work. Um, but at the same time, uh, you can do pretty much anything in this classroom. You can even lecture. Um, and many people have. <laughs> Most people do not. But you can pre pretty much any, uh, the way, what I really like about this design is almost any activity I can think about, I can find a way to implement. If I want students to do physics experiments as part of their activities, I can do physics experiments as long as I have the equipment. I have the room to do it. My limitation is it just has to, can't be more than a third of the table. And actually the reason, so keep in mind, I was at this project from the beginning 
And I was actually the one who suggested the seven foot diameter tables because we found we needed bigger than a six foot table uh, to actually have enough room for some of these tabletop experiments that we wanted to do. We found, and what was that? Well, that's another story for another time. All right, now, the other part that we developed as part of Scale Up, there were three aspects to it. The classroom design, classroom management techniques, and the curriculum. Classroom design, you don't have to worry. That's been done for you. Classroom management techniques, we'll talk various times during this presentation, during this workshop. So the classroom techniques also facilitate the group works. Now, keep in mind, you have, right now we've got five tables with one, two, three, four tables, five tables. So typically for the classroom organization, the tables are numbered. We have three groups labeled A, B, and C. And you find that can often facilitate. So one of the nice things about this design, now the first classroom that we had, scale of the classroom we had, we could not store um, equipment for experiments in the room. So we'd have to bring them out on a cart. Nice thing about these tables is we made one big bin per table and we just basically dropped it off. And we found I could go from talking like this to an experiment in about two minutes. So you can do that fairly quickly. Um, the other thing, well, we'll talk more about the other things later. Um, we want to help students develop cooperative groups. I'll talk more about that in a little bit. Again, you want to create an environment that stresses positive interdependence, positive relationships between the students working together, and individual accountability. So it can't all be group work. You can't all basically, so this table can't all just give me assignments from the four of them. Each student has to be held responsible for their own work and their own learning. Curriculum design. Typically, the best curriculum will do a mix of learning styles. Um, one of the ways to think about this is try to engage as many of the students' senses as you can. As an example, I had a history teacher who, um, when talking about the great migrations from Europe to the Americas, would actually pass out a radish to each student and have them take a, and have them take a bite. And say, imagine if this was all you had to eat for four months was radishes. And then packing up, leaving your family, leaving your friends, leaving the, the only place that you've known may seem a little bit more understandable if you have a promise of a better life and a better future. Most of the activities in Scale Up, we recommend five to 15 minute activities for the majority. Does that mean you can't do anything longer? No. You can certainly do longer activities than that. Uh, but if you keep most of the activities short to five to 15 minutes, because you've got so many groups working at the same time, that's a good way to help keep the class together and make sure that you don't get too, uh, the fast groups don't get too far ahead, the slow groups don't get too far behind. And typically, we design activities to address conceptual understanding, applications, problem solving, and skill building. My guess is a lot of what same type of activities that you'll do in your classes. Group size, we talked a little about this. So again, three, two people, too few, four people on the border of too many, five people tends not to work. Now, it depends on the type of project, and you may want to check the literature in your own fields. Every academic field has education literature, has articles, research articles written on what works and what doesn't work and what's been tried. But most of the activities that we've looked at that I've had the experience to work with Three to four works really well. If you're going to do a lot of work with computers, typically one computer for every two students tends to work a little bit better. Scale up was sort of a compromise between those two ideas. Now, you might say, why does this classroom look the way that it does? And in fact, when we first had to describe the room to other people, we basically described it as the banquet hall model. Because you think about it, banquet halls have a lot in common with a scale-up room. You want to be able to e get around to all the people in the room. Instructors want to be able to get around and interact with all the groups. You want to have, and well, this is not, they won't necessarily have computers in a banquet hall, but you want the students to have access to computers. You want to be able to perform experiments, at least in those classes that have experiments. Uh, you want to be able to have whole class discussions. And you want to be able to have the students be able to display their work to their peers. Now, some of the other considerations that we had, since this was a larger studio design than had ever been tried before, and it's, it's actually working now with, with classrooms up to 200 students. Uh, 
you need to pay attention to your student faculty ratio and this is where things might get a little tricky here because my understanding is you don't have a lot of graduate TAs do you have graduate TAs teaching assistants yeah okay so if you have teaching assistants it may not be that hard um, if you don't have teaching assistants I'm gonna make a suggestion a little bit typically typically you want the lead instructor and a couple of fac facilitators in the room at the same time, depending on your class size. For a class of this size, one instructor is plenty. Um, but typically, you want to look at the student to faculty ratio. 20 to 40 to 1 is considered normal. 40 to 1 can be managed, but it's a little t it's a, it is a little tricky. 30 to 1 or less is recommended. And again, need to distribute and collect materials quickly. So I, could eat, so I could ask you to rip a paper out of your notebooks or whatever you're writing on, put them in a single pile, and I could collect them very quickly, for example. So the room design allows for very easy access for distributing papers back to distributing materials to the students and collecting materials to the students, from the students. And, well, this is a little difficult in this room. Um, some of the rooms have, better, have a little bit bigger podium in the middle, and that allows you to do some demonstrations. So while, while the students are working, the instructor is going to be walking around the room, listening and asking questions. Now, the cool thing about this is you don't have to worry about how good your presentation is. You don't have to worry that, you've got, that you left something out of your presentation or it wasn't just perfect or you couldn't find the right words. Don't need to worry about that. You're letting the students basically learn through the activities, coaching them, talking to them, listening to them. Okay. All right. So having my, now having heard me talk about this for a little bit, probably for too long, um, I'd like you to take another index card and write down, um, actually, no, sorry, not an in, uh, index card. I want you to take the colorful paper on your table. It should be enough for one per person. Okay. Now, I've heard that you use a polling system called Kahoot. Kahoot? Yes, OK. So sometimes when I'm not sure of the technology that's going to be in a classroom that I'm using, I go with a low-tech approach. This is, something that, this is something that's relatively easy to do. And we'll have this sheet available on our website for you to download if you wish. Um, so what I want you to do is basically fold this until it shows the answer or answers you want to express. So I'd like you to, not without discussing with your neighbor, I'd like you to show me what you think your biggest challenge would be in, without talking to your neighbor. Use this to show me, by a single letter or multiple letters, what you think your most difficult challenge would be in teaching a class this way. And flash them towards me when I ask you to. Does anyone need one more minute? to prepare their card, their response card. All right, show me. Hold it up and show me. Just fade, point it towards me. You don't have to look, make sure anyone else has it. Does anyone need more time? OK. OK, getting a pretty good distribution. Very cool. Now, I want you to turn to your neighbor and talk about your challenge and see if, you come, see if your group can come to consensus. See if you can come to agreement on the most difficult challenge after discussing it. So turn to your neighbor. I'll give you two minutes. I'm going to call time. So prepare your card. And... Get ready to show me. Hold on. So what you can now, if you want to give students a little bit of an anonymity, it's a little bit tricky in this room to do it this way. So Kahoot probably works better. But if you were in, say, a more traditional room, what I tell students is to hold the card under their, under their chin like this. And that gives them a certain amount of uh, anonymity in the, in the class if everyone's facing the same way. In this room, not so much. So is everyone ready? Does anyone need more time to prepare their card? Okay, flash me. 
Hold the card up. <laughs> Fabiola? And it looks like Anne? Anna? <laughs> Sure. And how do you deal with the students that have low self-confidence or are afraid of other students laughing at them? Or how do you deal because like this? They, 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 some students are fearful of speaking, even though they know they have a term. Okay. Um, I'm going to do things a little bit out of order then. Oh. And I'm going to answer, no, I'm going to answer your question. Because I'm going to show you an activity I do on the first day of class. Can we pass out the whiteboards, please? Now, for the moment, I want you to go ahead and start writing. The, pick a recorder in your group and start writing. And so typically, the first thing, the first, one of the things I do on the first day is I do an activity that um, the students, by the end of the I have the students do something individually, and I have them do the same thing in groups. And typically what ends up happening, this tap now, the activity I give, you have to alter it to your field and find something else that was appropriate. And we're willing to help you find that thing if you like. But the one we ask is how many two-step paces, one, two, would it take to walk from, say, um, Bogota to Medellin? And typically, the first, when they do it individually, like we actually do Los Angeles to New York, but I was trying to give you something more Colombian. For Los Angeles to New York, the answers range anywhere from 1,000 to 10 billion, but several orders of mag many orders of magnitude. And then when we ask them to do it in a group, it actually reduces to about 100,000 to 10 million. Um, and that immediately range. And so at the end of this activity, we asked the I asked the students to tell me about what the difference was between doing, the, doing this calculation individually and doing it as a group, and asked them, was there any advantage to one way or the other? And so they're telling me, well, as a group, we know more than we knew as an individual, which is very true. Groups have more resources than individuals. Um, the group can basically uh, check your reasoning. So telling someone, how, someone else how, you're, how you reason through something, what you were thinking as you're going through it, you can get feedback on your thinking. Um, and you can discuss ideas, and you can have discuss ideas back and forth. So basically by the end of that very first activity on the very first day, they're telling me the, they're telling me the benefits of working in a team. And the second activity you're going to do right now. And your second, this activity I want you to do on the whiteboard, is I want you to brainstorm. Now, does, every, does uh, who knows what I mean when I say brainstorm? Knows brainstorm. Excellent. OK. So in this case, I don't want you to evaluate. I just want you to basically throw down all the ideas you can. And I want you to brainstorm good rules for brainstorming as a group. Good rules, good guidelines for brainstorming in a group. On the whiteboards. I guess, uh, will that work? Maybe. I want you to stand behind your table. I want uh, one representative from each group to stand behind the table and give us one thing from your brainstorm. With, stand behind the table with the whiteboard. You can have one of your teammates hold the whiteboard. So two people standing. Okay, guys, we need to report back to the activity. So I do need you, whatever you have is good, is good enough. I will explain when we're done with this activity. That's for the next activity. Ask you to speak loud, very loudly. Use your outdoor voice. So that we don't have to do the microphone. All right, one from this group. Use in each idea. Okay. One that hasn't been said already. 
I like your first one. It's very good. A quantity better than quality. Not there is not a limit. And that's 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 great because you, you want to have a lot of ideas out there because a lot of them aren't going to work when you start evaluating. One from the group in here in the corner. Sorry. Setting a specific time is good. So that was one of the things I failed to do. I failed to tell you how much time you're going to have. And I've been very bad about that the last day or so. That's a very good thing to do. What's one on your list? Many ideas of the and, and okay, yeah. good. No constraints, no no restrictions on what you can talk about. Now, hopefully, it's going to be related. To, you're giving ideas that are related to the topic, but no no pre constraints. Something that hasn't been said already. Uh, to encourage students to build their own ideas based on what others. Uh, have said, but I think it's quite... So build on one another's ideas. Yes, like Excellent. to start like a building. Another one over here. Raise your hand to participate. Raise your hand, raise your hand to participate. Raise your hand to participate. Okay. I'm just sort of curious. What do you guys think about that one? I'm, I'm, uh, I'm a little bit mixed on that. Right, so if you had to wait to raise your hand, that might, now, now we, maybe not raise their hand, but maybe what, what, else, what, what kind of rule could we have here that might work better? Because if you have a big group. Right, but I'm, I'm talking about groups this size. Right, so don't talk while someone else is talking. Wait for them to finish. That might be a better guideline for small groups. One from you, from your group. Okay, good. Conflicting ideas. I'm sorry? Classify the ideas or don't classify the ideas? Okay. Right, and so the, in this acti particular activity, the idea is we don't want to get into um, eliminating ideas. We just want the process of getting the idea of getting all the ideas out there to be discussed later, to be evaluated later. But good thought. If you were going to evaluate right now, that would be a good one. And one more from this group. Okay, so put, put the ideas on post-its and arrange them and that way when you start doing your um, prioritizing, you can pull the ones out you don't want to use. Okay, not quite what would work in this class, but um, is there anyone that someone is just not, it would just, that they think is really good that has not been said yet? Any team have one, really, a really good one that hasn't been said yet? Yes. Right, no criticism. Very important. Right. Don't bully, don't laugh, don't make fun. Um, but can you see how doing an activity like this might make a better environment for students who are a little bit shy? The other thing you can do when you have a shy student group, you're actually done with that part. You, you can, oh, you, do you have one you want to share? Okay. We were talking about the size of the group. I mean, you have already told us that this, the, bear, the group size is three to four. Yes. But for brainstorming as well? For brainstorming as well, because the idea here is, um, I'm not going to get as much time to talk about this as I would like. There is information on the PowerPoint that I'm, that's going to be left here for you and it will also be available on our website. Um, so we'll talk more about the groups. But the idea here is that your teams, um, are going to be struck typically if you want to have some nice long open-ended activities activity work in class 
you need to have structured groups to make that work. And we call, we call the, uh, the particular type of structured group that we like to use is called a cooperative group. And you're going to basically form, form the teams, assign the teams. So this is an activity I do in the first week. My first teams are typically assigned in the second week, so that way the shifting of students between sections is pretty much died down, as at a minimum. So if I assign teams in the second week, the idea that people, I'd have to worry about people adding and dropping is sort of minimal at that point. And then we switch teams typically two or three times a semester. Um, I can talk to me later and I can tell you why we switch them. But I will just say that switching them tends to be important. In español. <laughs> okay, hold on. I'll turn my sound up. Okay. Yes. Esta mañana alguien me preguntaba es cuál, o sea, cuál es el, 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 la, la forma de organizar los grupos ideal. Eh, permitirles a ellos organizarse aleatoriamente o el profesor asigna eh, sin, digamos como que sin ningún criterio, pues algo como obligatorio, ¿cierto? Ustedes puede que no se conozcan, no son amigos, no, nada, pero... Okay. Okay. <laughs> Excellent question. Now, I don't believe this is actually in the literature anywhere, but when I spoke, when I've had discussions with um, people who do different types of active learning in the classroom, this is the consensus that seems to arise. It's basically the more structured your activities are, the less structured your groups need to be. So one curriculum that I use that is very structured, I still teach it in this room, but it's a very structured curriculum. Um, on the first class, the students will come in and I'll have them count, uh, let's see, so we have one, two, three, four, five groups. I'd have the students count one to five and form the groups randomly. And then I would switch them every couple days, every couple weeks, whatever, whatever feels like a good, the end of a unit, then I would switch them and randomize them again. And that way, um, some more difficult to work with team members don't, don't aggravate their teammates too much for that short period of time. Um, if you have more open-ended activities, so we have periods where we'll go maybe as long as an hour, sometimes longer, on an in-class activity, very open-ended, and we find that for that type of activity, where it requires some creativity and decision-making and on the behalf of the students, and it's, a little, it's less structured and less guided, then we need to structure the groups to help the students make progress. And if we were going to structure the groups, this is how we would structure them. So basically, we typically do it on exams. Now you say, okay, in the second week of class, you've already given an exam? Well, sort of. On the first day of class, we give them a pretest. It's basically a con an overview of the concepts they're going to be learning. And uh, we basically look at the scores. We basically break the class into thirds based on their performance on that. Now, maybe you don't have a good pretest of material you're going to be teaching. Well, then you could do it based on GPA um, or some other measure of the student's ability. GPA tends to actually be a very good measure. It actually correlates very well with student success. Um, but whatever measure you're using, divide the class into thirds, top, middle, and bottom, and assign to groups. Now here, let's say you have a full class. So you have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten tables. Maybe nine, I mean, I've lost track. But however many tables you have, you take the, let's say you have nine tables. You take the top nine students, assign one per table. They're your star. Um, that's basically, the, because basically one of the advantages of these round tables with multiple groups, as opposed to having one table per group, is that the teams can help each other and form a super group. Um, there are activities where sometimes we do use the whole table, but even if they're doing individual activities in the group, uh, one of the advantages of this arrangement is, let's say um, the class is stuck. There's a, there's a point in the activity where students are getting stuck and they just, we haven't got, we haven't ta I haven't taught them something they need to get through it. I made a misjudgment. So I can go around here. We've got three tables over here. I go, there's two other groups here, but I talk to this group and I help them get the activity. They then teach the other teams of this group. I can then teach one group here, one group here, one group here, one group there, one group there. 
So, or your however many you and however many facilitators you have um, can do that, and you find that the amount of time the student spans stuck is minimized because the groups can help each other. So, whereas a group has more resources than an individual, a table has more resources than a group. And in fact, we picked the circular tables specifically because when we experimented with different table designs, we found the circular tables were the, were, gave you the best, the most interactions between groups and within groups. So basically, the, the, we created the circular table was the best environment for getting people to work together. Um, so you put your one top student in each group, so that way there's <laughs> one person at the table who's more likely to pick things up quickly than the rest of the table. Doesn't always work out that way, but um, you may want to pair women and minority students. That's a judgment call based on your field and your own experience. Uh, not knowing the culture here, I, don't, I would don't, wouldn't know how to recommend you. I'm going to use your best judgment is what I would say. Um, 20 years ago, we did that regularly. After a few years, we did that with the first groups. And I still do this, Rebecca still does this, but Bob Beekner, who was my, my advisor for the Scale Up Project, um, he stopped doing it, and it has not affected student performance. You have to make that judgment with your own students. And again, reshuffle two or three times during the semester. Okay, um, the reason for that is uh, when you keep students together for the entire semester, I don't know why, well, I have some idea why, between the eighth week and the twelfth week, the student performance drops. And so normally I can get through, in, two hour, in an hour and 15 minutes, I can get through five or six activities. I can get through about three activities during that period of time. Uh, there's, I don't know if it's, I suspect that they may be tired, they may be committing more of their time to their other classes outside of class. You just get that, they get, too, they get so comfortable in their groups, they're willing to sort of let things go a little bit. So uh, we recommend shuffling two or three times. We have tried shuffling mid-semester. How are your semesters 14 weeks, 15 weeks? 14. 14, okay. So on a 14-week semester, we tried switching mid-semester. And 16, sorry. All right, even, I think you'll find this will be even more true. Um, the longer the semester, the more this is true, actually. So with the 16-week, uh, with that, with the, basically you switch mid-semester. It doesn't matter how many times you've told the students you're going to switch the groups. It always becomes the most traumatic experience in the class <laughs> when you switch mid-semester. Because they've really gotten very attached after, eight, after seven or eight weeks, six, seven, eight, well, seven or eight weeks. Um, and it just causes a lot of unhappiness in your class. There's no need to cause that unhappiness if you can avoid it. So instead of doing that, we reshuffle two or three times during the semester. So I typically have two midterm exams and a final. I just shuffle after each exam. And that gives me three period groups. And because it's only five to six weeks for each, for each uh, t period of time when the teams are together, that period of time seems to be, a, be small enough that it's a lot less, it, I don't know why, but it's a lot less traumatic than if you do it mid-semester. All right, next activity. All right, you've been given three sheets. So I went to uh, an invest, I know that this school was based on business, so I thought an investment activity would be useful. Um, so, I've give, so I have an investment service that gives me advice on what stocks to pick. I've given you three reports, translated them to Spanish using Google Translate. Um, and what I want you to do is, base, so these are advisories, these are stocks that are, they're basically saying they, they think are good buys. Now just because they think it's a good buy does not make it so. So I want you to take a look at the three sheets. Maybe one person in each team read one sheet. If there's, you need an extra sheet, uh, that can be, I'm sure that can be arranged. Just raise your hand. Um, and what I want you to do is uh, take a couple minutes to read the sheet. Let's say two minutes to read the sheet, three minutes to convince your neighbors that your stock is the one to invest in. And then I'm going, to, at the end, I'm going to ask your team which stock, you which stock, if any, you chose and why. It is permissible to say you don't like any of them as long as you can tell me why. <laughs> Seems like a long time. <laughs> Two years ago, just when you leave, when I you stop giving classes, you know you can get rest. Right, I stopped doing university classes two years ago, too. 
so you understand. Yes. Once when I was a professor, when I used to look at these topics of active sessions, there was an interesting book. I'm trying to remember the name, but it was based on the education that they give in Finland and hmm. Denmark. Um, if you need to join with another group for right now, go ahead. Sorry? Isn't that how you write three million? Is that not how you write three million pesos? No, it's not that No, I'm sorry. I thought I was told it was. I'm sorry. My intent was three million pesos. Time, time. Got to call you together. We have to be out of here in five minutes. Time, time. So what I want you to do is I'm going to call on each group. Uh, one person from each group, tell me one stock you want to invest in, one reason why, or tell me no stocks and one reason why. <laughs> Sylvia? <laughs> one stock, one reason. Eh, bueno, eh, escogimos invertir en Cognex. Decidimos invertir en Cognex, es una fábrica de sistemas de artificial para clientes en el mundo. Eh, tiene una gran diversificación, digamos, de sus clientes. Entonces, no solamente de Lectores de código de barra en las tiendas, sino también a los hospitales y también están incursionando en los aeropuertos para las rutas de los equipajes. Es una de sus fortalezas y la otra muy importante es una gran inversión, digamos, en investigación y desarrollo, alrededor del 15% de sus ingresos anuales, además de que tienen una gran cultura de trabajo. Eh, de diversión e innovación y, y los empleados son muy comprometidos por, por esa cultura. Tiene un precio reciente de 90.10. Normally I would not allow that, but I'm short on time, so I'm going to have to. Um, Claudia. Uh, we are going to invest in iRobot because it's a, an emerging company. Uh, the value of the company, uh, I mean the amount of money that we are going to invest in this company is going to give us a big market a big share in the in the company so we know that is a is a risk because it's a company that is just started but we are sure that we are going to have a good return and also because we have a diversified portfolio so we can invest in this okay good reasons <laughs> one more this may not be doing a good job of talking to each other so one thing you can do in this case this often happens more with second and third groups with first groups, they negotiate a contract and they share their expectations of one another. Typically, the first groups work really well. Sometimes the second groups, even though they put together a contract of their expectations, um, sometimes they, they may not communicate as well as you would like. If you have that situation, this is a good type of activity. It's called a jigsaw activity. Normally, what I would do with more time is I would have counted you off and had, let's say, that be table one, that be table two, that be table three, had multiple copies for everyone to read at one of the, ta one of the three tables. Uh, so your group splits up so each, you, so into three different parts to do three different tasks, and then you come together and try and make a complete report from the three different pieces of information. So the key is not one person in the group has all the information. The information is split between the different members of the team and you have to work together to, put it, uh, to basically come up with a whole report. No one person can do the report without the others. It's a really good activity for encouraging your students to work together. It's a good activity to, go, to do in general, but it's particularly good if you need to encourage your teams to uh, basically to improve how they work together. I apologize. I was hoping to do a lot more with you, but um, we have what we have. You've, I've given you a sample of different activities. I've told you some of the things to be aware of. My PowerPoint will be available. 
And I'm also going to send to Monica an article I've written on scale-up uh, giving a broader overview and going into uh, go talking a little bit more about some of these details and why we do why they are the way they are. I hope you got something out of it, and I wish you luck. And of course, you're always welcome to contact Rebecca, myself, or Luana um, for additional help. Um, there are some different models for activities, and if I had, if you want to hang around outside the room, I'll be happy to talk to you about those. <laughs> welcome. welcome. Hold on. Esto funciona. Pues es, ese tipo de actividad funciona cuando tú no tienes una respuesta única o también funciona cuando haces, pues digamos, actividades que solamente tienen una función. Es un poquito pues lo que sucede con el caso eh, de estudio, que se supone que los casos de estudio tienen múltiples respuestas, pero hay materias, pues o hay cursos en donde no es posible que tengamos múltiples respuestas. ¿Aún así funcionaría? Well, for example, in the case of a case study, and that, that would, the question was about, if you give an example, if you only have one, if you only have, sorry, hold on a second. Um, so let's say you were doing a case study, which again, a case study would only have one result. Instead of having just one case study, maybe have three related case studies, each one with one result. Now, as a, and your, the student's job would then be to report on all three at the same time. As one, as one related report, citing three different case studies as their evidence. Each team member would then have a piece of the information needed to do the complete report. So in physics, I would do this as three separate lab activities. That the stu that each one has a single result, would probably have a single result, and then, but uh, the students would have to combine those activities and their results to form a single report as their assignment. I would definitely have them read it before class. Um, I was no way I would have them read something eight pages long. This was probably longer than it should have been for an in-class. Um, I just didn't put enough thought. I should have put more thought into how to make it shorter. I, did, I neglected to do that. And that's one of the things you're going to find, is that particularly the first time you're doing things, is you're going to have to learn. Uh, from, you're going to have to try something, see what works, see what you need to improve the next time. After every class, I strongly recommend that same day preferably within an hour of the class itself if you can, write some notes on what worked and what you want to work on in more detail for next time, what you need to fix for next time to make it better. Again, thank you. <laughs>